Amazon, and uh, sort of the inspiration for this project grew out of what we do there. And uh, what we do, one of, the one of the core things we do is we collect streaming metrics every second. And uh, some of the metrics we collect are total output, um, instantaneous output, cadence, resistance uh, from the bike as you're riding. Um, so the, in case you're not familiar with the product, it's a uh, bike that um, sort of tracks your workouts and tracks your metrics as you work out. Um, so we collect metrics as you're riding. And uh, the idea for this project is to use these metrics to create a unique sound experience uh, based on certain input parameters. Um, this isn't a live project. Uh, this is a weekend sort of hacking project that uh, sort of grew out of personal interest. And um, another big inspiration for this project is sort of the use of like software synths. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the library Pio, but um, I'm personally just interested in the use of uh, software synthesizers um, sort of mocking out um, what hardware synths and analog synths do from sort of the early uh, 20th century. So Pio. Uh, Pio is an open source project. Anyone can look at it and download it. It's uh, been developed since 2009 by a gentleman named Olivier at the University of Montreal. Um, it's in active development. Uh, the most recent version, 080, was released May 15th. Uh, that's the version I'll be using for my live demos. And um, the basic idea is that you can create uh, digital signal processing chains in Python. Um, the actual logic for, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about sort of what I know about the library, the actual logic is written in C extensions um, using Python objects in C. And, uh, and this diagram uh, sort of from the documentation sort of details um, how uh, the data gets transferred around um, and what the different Py PIO objects uh, control. Uh, one thing I will note about this library, it has excellent documentation, um, tons of tutorials uh, to go through it, and um, also a, a fantastic community. Um, Uh, so last year, around uh, November, um, the creator of the library, Olivier, emailed out to the community and said, hey, I'm just curious, like, what are people using this library for? Um, it turns out, like, a ton of different people, or a ton of people responded and said they're using it for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of the most, one of the, uh, the first responder, actually, to the thread uh, responded saying they're using it for auditory psychology experiments. Um, interestingly enough, uh, there's a library called PsychoPy, uh, which uses a <laughs> which uses a uh, sort of like sound generates sound that you would respond to. Uh, one of the convenient things that Pio offers is the ability to send sound to different channels, so you could send things to the left and right channel to see how people process sound, um, also to see how they respond to sound input. Um, Another very useful application of this project is for teaching. Uh, it's very easy to take a, and, and I'll actually do this in the presentation, is to take a math formula and translate it in, into sound. Um, another interesting application, uh, artistic projects. Um, interactive sound, because everything in the library is computed in real time, it's very possible to create uh, sort of art that responds to user interaction in some way. Uh, both uh, for this library in particular in auditory sense. Um, and also, people are using it to plug their instruments in and create sound effects, uh, just programmers, hobbyists. Um, the example I have here is Zine, which is a Pio child, uh, which basically is a uh, software synth that is built entirely on Pio. And then uh, the final one here that I listed is uh, sound experimentation. Uh, Pio is very useful for uh, creating digital signal processing chains that output sound in interesting ways. So uh, I won't actually play this one for you, but this is sort of the hello world of Pio. And uh, the basic idea is you have a server instance uh, from Pio, um, and you boot that instance, which connects it to all of your audio inputs. And then you start the server, which means it starts reading output from stream objects. Um, the basic architecture for this example 
is that a uh, sign object is responsible for processing a stream. The server object keeps a buffer alive, sort of, which then uh, sort of has a callback with the sign object for generating samples and putting samples into that buffer. Um, you can specify that buffer size manually. And then it connects to, in this case, port audio. There's other audio backends that you can use, um, Jack, Core Audio for Mac OS X. Uh, port audio works great. Um, and port audio, uh, the way it works is that it sort of creates a callback that allows you to um, send it sound samples when it, whenever it requests. So uh, basically, it, it has a callback function written in C that um, runs close to real time. It's a high priority thread on the OS that uh, calls your server object and expects sound output, expects, expects a certain amount of sound samples, probably about uh, another configurable parameter, but um, something close to like 10th of a second or something like that. Um, so yeah, I'll start out with this example. Uh, the basic idea here is that uh, with these examples is that I'm going to sort of um, write a little bit of code and then play a sound sample and then we're going to build up a more interesting example sort of as we go. Um, and I do apologize, these are live demos so I you know, hope they go according to plan. So this one, the sign example, That's uh, three even harmonics, and you can specify the multiplication factor on each harmonic, um, and then you send it to the output. Um, and this uh, diagram is actually generated by the PyO library um, in what's called a scope. Uh, it's sort of mocking out what like an oscilloscope would do um, in like a real environment. Okay, so this is a more interesting example. Um, the basic idea here is that we're going to play that sign sample uh, through a fader, which just basically does exactly what it says. Uh, it fades in for a tenth of a second and fades out for a half a second, um, and it lasts for one second, and then also uh, multiplies the sample by three so it's not too loud. And uh, the delay then feeds back half of that sample into the original signal and outputs uh, and basically creates an output that um, del is delayed by about half a second. So I'll play the delay example. So you can see in about, uh, you know, 10 line, less than 10 lines of code, we can already start to kind of create some interesting music, some interesting sounds. Um, now, the part I didn't talk about here is that you sort of have to play the fader. You have to start it and fade in and out. Um, a lot of the examples in Pio use uh, sort of sleep. Um, this doesn't really matter on a server environment because the server is actually running the entire time. Uh, but if you wanted to play in sort of scripts that then you have to just sleep for a certain amount of time. Um, just a caveat of the library. But this pattern of um, sort of just playing a signal and letting it resonate and then playing it again and then sleeping is so common that Pio creates a, a pattern object that allows you to play um, functions. So the first, is, the first argument to the pattern object is the play pointer and that plays for about two seconds and then waits two seconds and then plays it again. Um, so this is actually the same example we just saw, but, uh, and, but it um, just is less code. So um, what I'm trying to illustrate here is uh, sort of how these signal processing chains get more com complex. Um, the basic idea is like the output of one is kept in, the, uh, in a Python object and then passed as input into another object. So uh, the basic, I, or what this one sounds like, I'll play it for you, the LFO example. So 
So um, one thing you'll notice is similar to like analog synths, you can pass any table object into any um, input of a uh, PIO object. So the delay variable on the delay is actually a, a low frequency oscillator that's oscillating at four hertz and um, sort of input. And then you can kind of see from the signal that um, the delay is, uh, from the signal down below, that the delay is kind of creating this envelope um, if you look closely. And then uh, you can, pat and using the low frequency oscillator as the delay, um, you can sort of make more interesting sounds uh, similar to like an analog synth. Now this is just kind of a more interesting example that also illustrates the same point, um, but it's passing in uh, a sort of low frequency oscillator for a sine wave into uh, the frequency of a low pass filter. Um, so that sounds like this. And you can see from the scope that it's actually rounding out some of the curves in a, in a sort of sine fashion. Um, some of the uh, frequencies are clearly cut out, um, or some of the higher frequencies are clearly cut out by the low pass filter. So my library, Sound Engage, um, is uh, a layer on top of PIO. And the idea is you use external input. Um, in this case, I'll be running a Flask app that runs a PIO server. And then you control parameters in your DSP chain. Um, so for this example, I'll sort of go through, um, instead of sort of a sine wave, I'll use kind of MIDI input. Um, via the Python library Mido. Um, on Mac OS X, it's actually not thread safe to read and write MIDI in the same thread. Um, so, or uh, sorry, in the same process, uh, different threads in the same process, so I use subprocesses. Um, but the basic idea is once you get a MIDI input into the PIO chain, um, you can run it through several DSP uh, steps in order to kind of create music. Um, so I'll kind of start, I'll, hopefully this example works. Uh, a little more complicated. Oh, yeah. This is just illustrating uh, sort of what the default behavior is, sort of the maximum output of the uh, function. So this is really just a point of reference right now. Um, we'll sort of start to see the interactions in a little bit. So basically the parameters that are input into the um, library is you give it an input domain. Um, so for this, for the input is uh, somewhere, some integer between zero and five. And um, in the library, you actually specify, or it, if it's over five, it'll just count it as five. If it's below zero, it's, um, you know, counts it as zero. Uh, the idea, the thinking behind that is that um, sort of from a UX perspective, you don't want to, certain parameters, like say for example, um, and this is kind of a dummy example, like you wouldn't want to have your volume be controlled by an input parameter that could grow infinitely. Um, and usually you wouldn't want to control volume because that's kind of like a cheap way of controlling engagement. But um, so for this chain, uh, I put the variable name uh, the, for the low pass filter BQ on the, on the chain and you specify that variable and then which, uh, which parameters you actually want to change. So for the frequency parameter, this is the cutoff frequency of the low pass filter. You would control it anywhere between 300 and 2000. Um, that would sort of linearly fit uh, anywhere in that input domain. And then also to, because this isn't a voltage controlled filter, um, you want to control the multiplication factor of the low pass filter to sort of so that the volume is a little bit controlled. That's actually also one of the reasons we have the compressed stage. 
uh, at the end of the chain. The compressed stage controls the energy of the signal, so it's, it's not going to, uh, the volume isn't going to change too much. But, um, so I'll demo, oh, um, so basically what it's doing in the DSP chain uh, is, is it's sort of branching out in different places uh, for each level of the DSP chain. Um, it keeps the original chain the same as long as none of the variables are changing, and then from the output of the chorus variable, uh, the chorus object, it creates two new chains, and then combines them at the end with uh, another PIO object, the input fader. Um, and that's so that you don't hear clipping between the two signals when you switch, when you switch outputs. Uh, so yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about this. For this demo input, um, I'll go second, it'll go second by second. Um, of course, you could do it faster than that because it's a real-time processing engine, but um, we'll show, I'll show sort of like it's staying the same and then rising slowly, uh, falling off shortly, rising really fast, falling off really fast, and then sort of ending on the final output. Um, so this is about a 15 second sample of uh, what Sound Engage does. So this is the period in which it's growing. Then it goes back to zero. Actually, I'll show the output of the server so it's sort of easier to see. So that's kind of the basic example of the library. Um, now, say you wanted to add a, another, uh, the difference between this slide and this slide is that we're adding a delay in the chain. Um, so we're kind of creating a similar, similar idea, but we're adding a delay. And uh, you can specify in the library now that you want the input parameter to control feedback on the, delay, on, the, on the delay object as well as the um, low-pass uh, low filter. Um, so we'll feed back into the input signal anywhere between half of the signal and none of the input signal. And what this will do is it will create, uh, sort of branch out on each of the original signals um, into four new delay signals that will automatically select which one and move from each PIO object to the correct one, basically, and select the output, uh, select the, the correct output for the input fader. Um, so I'll pass in the same demo input, uh, but this time just with the delay. And then... <laughs> So you can hear sort of as it's rising that it has more delay. And then as it's falling, it has like no delay. Uh, cool. Well, that is um, sort of it for the demos. Uh, some of the developments we can do with this library um, have it configurable so that you could sort of uh, control the chain in a way that is as fast as possible. So, for example, if you wanted to send it metrics every tenth of a second as opposed to every second, you would want the library to automatically figure out how complex your chain could be. 
Um, I've experimented with some chains where the stream processing actually isn't fast enough. Um, so that's one thing you could do with the library, allow it to validate that your stream is actually possible. Um, you probably noticed with the low pass filter that on the first step that it kind of jumps to a point where it's uh, sort of more audible and you're hearing sort of like less round frequencies uh, between the zero and the one step. If you made that quadratic or even better exponential because that's sort of um, how human hearing, human hearing works for a low pass filter, then um, the nonlinear adjustment would be sort of more interesting or a, sin or a sinusoidal adjustment. Um, also having conditions, uh, you could have a condition where uh, if an input stays at a certain level for a certain amount of time, um, that the library will automatically play a sound. Uh, sort of uh, what I wanna do with the project next is use derivatives and moving averages to control the sound output as opposed to just the second by second interval. So that would be you have a one second uh, value, a two second value and a five second value and then you have a one second derivative, uh, how much the signal is changing over two seconds and how much the signal is changing over five seconds. And then you might probably notice from the example that I was using the Final Fantasy Prelude. Um, it would be very exciting if we could uh, just kind of create melodies that also respond to input parameters. And um, since this is a server side technology, it would be uh, even cooler if you were in like a chat room with you know, four or five people generating input, and you were grouping their averages together. Um, so the basic idea there is uh, using the same input for one person for multiple people. Um, Pio objects actually allow you to access their samples. So similar to the way port audio works, you could uh, redirect the system audio back to like a browser, for example, using the get function on a PIO object. Um, that's one way of doing it. You could also just broadcast your system uh, sound via, there's proprietary tools that do that. And uh, yeah, that's it. Um, some uh, resources here, there's a site uh, that a friend wrote called jazz.computer. Um, and uh, there's a great wiki page for Python and music, and a, uh, like I said before, the Pio Discuss mailing list, if you're interested in Pio, has a ton of activity. Uh, thanks for your time. I think we're out of time, but. <laughs>